We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you're interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Well, today we're stepping into Daniel chapter five as we continue this series on the book of Daniel. And I'm teaching a message I'm calling the writing on the wall or the writing is on the wall. And most of us have heard that phrase at some point in time in our lives, the writing is on the wall. And Daniel five is where this phrase originates. It comes from Daniel 5, and it's this idea that something unpleasant or un- unwelcome is inevitable, that the writing is on the wall, that it, it's going to happen. And uh, speaking of, did you hear the story about the graffiti artist who broke up with her boyfriend? The writing was on the wall. <laughs> Feel free to laugh, it's funny. <laughs> I know, it's bad. Um, This is what my daughters go through every morning on the ride to school, Um, so pray for them. The writing is on the wall. Now, I've shared with you in the first part of this series on the book of Daniel. Remember, we're covering Daniel 1 through 6 this spring, and then in the fall, we're going to be picking up with Daniel 7 through 12. Remember, Daniel chapters 1 through 6 are more historical in nature. 7 through 12 are more prophetic in nature, the foretelling of events. And so as we've been walking through Daniel chapters 1 through 6, I've done my best to kind of fill in a lot of the historical pieces around what we're reading in the Word of God that gives us a little more context. And the same is going to be true for Daniel chapter 5, because we have several um, extra biblical historical sources that give us an even, an even more complete picture of what it is that we're about to read and study in Daniel chapter 5. Now, a couple of things you need to know. Number one, that the events of this chapter are about 30 years after the events of Daniel chapter 4. So like Daniel 4 was 25 to 30 years after Daniel 3, now we're talking 30 years after Daniel chapter 4 as we step into chapter 5. Another important um, event that you need to know about is that the king of Babylon at this point is a man by the name of Nabonidus. And just before what we're about to read, Nabonidus lost a very significant military battle to a king by the name of Cyrus of the Medo-Persian Empire. And this happened roughly 50 miles north of the city of Babylon. So over these 30 years between Daniel 4 and Daniel 5, Babylon has really lost a lot of its power and influence. It's kind of, it's kind of on, on the back end of its, of its reign or of its influence, and it's going downhill very, very quickly. And at this point, really, the city of Babylon is the only part of the Babylonian empire that has yet to fall to the Medo-Persians. Now, with that in mind, there's a co-regent king who is uh, reigning with his father, Nabonidus. His name is Belshazzar, and he's actually with in the city walls of Babylon. And with this military defeat just happening, he throws this huge feast. Now, why would he throw a feast? There are some who say, well, he threw the feast because it was a calendar feast. It was already on the calendar. And so he was trying to provide some sort of normalcy for his people with the Babylonian empire, like losing its power. There are others who say that he's throwing this feast to try to boost morale, to boost the morale of of the city. And he's throwing this feast, this is important, behind the city walls. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important in just a moment. Now, this is interesting. For all of you who love history, according to two Greek historians, Herodotus and Xenophon, we can date the event of Daniel 5 precisely to October 12th, 539 BC, October 12, 539 BC. So with that in mind, let's step into Daniel 5 this morning. Daniel 5 verses 1 through 4. This section, we're just calling it the feast, the feast. Verse number one, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Now this detail in front is very important. But before I get there, King Belshazzar, again, is a co-regent king with his father, Nabonidus, who had just been defeated. And when he was defeated, he actually fled from the, from the battlefield. So he's on the run while this is happening. Now, it says that he drank wine in front of this party or in front of those that, that he called together for this feast. And that's an important detail. 
The reason it tells us that is because it's significant. Okay, if this were something normal that the king would do, it wouldn't include the detail. Why would you have to include that? But because it says in front of, that tells us that the king is normally operating in isolation. Keep that in mind. He normally functions in isolation out of sight of the people. So what this tells us is he's probably trying to boost the morale. He's out in front of the people. He's accessible to the people. Normally he would operate in isolation. Now, back to the city walls. As I told you last Sunday, the city walls of Babylon are considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the city walls were huge. They, there were actually two wall systems that went around the city. The outer wall system was the most extraordinary. It was 17 miles long. The outer wall system was 25 feet wide and it was 40 feet in height. So keep this in mind because the Persian army is waiting just outside the city. Here the king is throwing this feast. And what it tells us is he has this this sense of security behind these walls. Okay, it's okay because we're behind these walls. Nothing can touch us because we're behind these walls. And when you get to that point, it's very easy to get sloppy in your leadership when you let your guard down, which is what happens. Verse two, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine. Okay, now let me just be clear on what tasted means. He didn't take a sip or two of wine and it wasn't a glass or two of wine. The wording means ongoing, okay? So it got out of control. He tasted the wine and in doing that, commanded. Now this is important. He commanded what? That the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father. Now I went there just a minute because you just said his father was Nabonidus. He was. Nebuchadnezzar was most likely his grandfather, but in this day and age, it wasn't unusual to speak of a grandfather or a predecessor as a father, which is why this language, we're gonna see this all throughout Daniel chapter five. So Nebuchadnezzar, his father, again, most likely his grandfather, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. He commanded they be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and concubines might drink from them. So a couple of things here. The fact that it mentions his wives and his concubines, this ongoing drinking, this tells us that this feast had become uh, this drunken, immoral feast with these details that, that we read about. So here the king is, he's drunk, his judgment is impaired, his mind isn't clear, and he makes a grave mistake, a big mistake. That is, he calls for these vessels that had been used in temple worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem, that Nebuchadnezzar had defeated, destroying the city and the temple, and had taken, remember back from chapter one, had taken from Jerusalem, and he brings them into this drunken, immoral feast. And he's using these vessels that God intended as worship for something other than what God had purposed them for. It's a grave mistake. In verse three, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And here's what's happening. Again, the Medo-Persian empire is just outside of the city waiting for the opportunity to overtake the city. And the people know this. And what is Belshazzar doing? He's making a statement to the people of the superiority of the Babylonian gods over the gods of other nations. Now, you've got to understand this, that even, even according to Babylonian standards, this would have been considered very offensive so even all the lords who were at the feast, when they heard him call for these golden vessels from the temple in Jerusalem, like it would have raised their eyebrows and it would be like, whoa, like what is he doing? And it further tells us that he is operating and leading from a place of isolation. So what I wanna do this morning is I'm gonna give you a series of statements regarding the writing on the wall. And the first one is this, the writing is on the wall if you're making decisions in isolation. 
The writing is on the wall if you're making decisions in isolation. Proverbs 18, one, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. And I say this often and I cannot say it often enough. And that is isolation is not just having no one around you. Isolation could be having the wrong people around you. That's a form of isolation as well. And this is one of the many reasons. This is one of the, I could give you a hundred reasons of why all of us should be connected to a small group. It's because you do not want to make the most significant decisions in your life apart from gospel-centered community and wise godly counsel. I can take you back, Carrie and I, I can take you back from dating to engagement, engagement to marriage, and marriage into the first few years of our ministry. And if there is one thing that we did well, and there's a lot we learned, don't get me wrong, and there's a lot of mistakes that we did made, and we, we learned along the way what it was like for marriage and be married and, and all of these things, just like we all have. But if there is one thing I will tell you that we did well, it has been that at every major decision, every major intersection, we were very intentional with surrounding ourselves with wise, godly counsel. And I cannot stress that enough. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever the case, whatever stage of life you're in, you need to be surrounded by wise, godly counsel. Do not make significant decisions in life in isolation. No one has ever said that once I isolated, I got better. Nobody's ever said that. Now, here's what happens. In isolation, though he's got a lot of people around him, Belshazzar's call for the vessels turns into a call for help. Look at verses 5 through 12. I'm calling this the writing on the wall, the writing on the wall. Now, what we're about to read is the supernatural event in Daniel 5 that Daniel 5 is best known for. Verse 5, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. This is a supernatural sobering moment. And just like Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, what does he do? He calls for this group of wise men to come in and he says, if you can interpret that writing on the wall, I will give you gifts and I will give you a promotion. And just like his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar found out, remember this is the third instance now of these wise men being called. This is strike three for them. This is it. They've been up three times now and they've swung and they've missed every time. Never could they come, go, come through. And what does that mean for the king? It goes from bad to worse. Look at this in verse nine. The king, then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. He went from alarmed and now he's greatly alarmed. Bad to worse and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. And now in verse 10, the queen enters. The queen, because of the words of the kings and his lords, the king and his lords rather, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Very quickly, the identity of this queen, who was it? Some say that this would have been the wife of Nebuchadnezzar, which would have made her the grandmother of Belshazzar. Others say, no, that she was probably the wife of Nabonidus, which would have made her Belshazzar's mother. In either case, she says, there's a man in the kingdom by the name of Daniel who has been a constant source of wisdom. You need to call for him. Verses 13 through 28. The interpretation, the interpretation. So what's going to happen is that Daniel's now going to enter the scene. And at this point, he's probably 80 years of age. 
Now, he had most likely retired from public life or at least semi-retired from public life about 20 years prior when Nebuchadnezzar passed away. And so now here he is, 80. He's been trying to kind of gear down. And what does God do? God says, I'm not finished with him yet. And he's called back into the picture. Verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. And it's hard to see this as we read this in the English, but... In the original language, this language is very arrogant and very condescending. Oh, you're that Daniel. One of those exiles that came from Judah. Oh, you're one of them. And it tells us that he most likely resented Nebuchadnezzar's regime as well. So here is this young man, this king. He's full of pride and arrogance. And he says to Daniel, if you can interpret the dream or interpret rather the handwriting on the wall, I will give you gifts and I'll give you a promotion. Now, what does Daniel do since he's got a captive audience? He does what I do every Sunday when I've got a captive audience. He preaches a message to him. And here's the message, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts, give the rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing the king to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all the peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. Whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. Whom he would, he humbled. And you get the picture like Belshazzar says, just, just tell me the interpretation. This is a long introduction by Daniel. And he says in verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up, he did it to himself, Daniel says. And his spirit was hardened. He did it to himself so that he dealt, how? Proudly. He was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. And to what end was God working in Nebuchadnezzar's life? to the end of eliminating pride from his heart so that he would humbly acknowledge Yahweh as the one true sovereign God. And what the wording implies is the wording implies that Nebuchadnezzar did this to himself. God brought judgment and humility. In verse 21, he was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And what Daniel does is he makes a connection between the pride of Nebuchadnezzar and the pride that's in Belshazzar. And what we're gonna see, it says this in verse 22, he draws this conclusion, and you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. He's telling Belshazzar, you witnessed God's judgment on your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. You witnessed it. You saw what God does to those whose heart are lifted up in pride. And not only did you follow that same pattern of pride, he says, you took pride to another level with blasphemy, with taking the, the instruments the, of worship that God had intended for the temple and using them in worship of the Babylonian gods. He witnessed all of these things in Nebuchadnezzar. And what does he do? He makes a mockery out of God. And God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. And what we have here is a picture of what foolishness looks like. Foolishness is when you know what to do, yet you don't do it. And so you write down this statement. The writing is on the wall if you know what to do and you don't do it. The writing is on the wall if you know what to do and don't do it. If I had a nickel, like this, this is without question, the most, this is the phrase I hear used most often. And if I had a nickel for every time I heard it, our debt would be paid off as a church. 
I know I should, but. I know we should, but. Yeah, that would be good for us, but. Well, if you know it's what you should do, and you know it's good for you, and you know it's God's best for you, like if you know that you should do it, then why do you not do it? If you know the end result is gonna benefit you, then why would you not do it? And the answer is, is because it's so easy to deceive ourselves, to think that we're the exception. Like an example, James 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Read it with me. Deceiving yourselves. Not only is it possible to deceive yourself, it's probable that you'll deceive yourself to see yourself as the exception to God's standard, to see yourself as the exception to the rule. You give yourself a pass, no one else gets one, but you get a pass, right? You have your own set of rule, your own set of standards. It's very easy. Listen to me. Doing what the word of God says is not always easy. But I'm telling you, the sooner that you're obedient to it, it's going to save you a lot of heartache and headache and pain in the long run. It always will. And this language is very emphatic language. Look at this verse 23. But you, but you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored him. Belshazzar should have learned from Nebuchadnezzar's example, but he didn't. And because he didn't, he's going to fall on the wrong side of history. When I read this story, I think of the words of the German historian George Hegel who said this, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. And when I think of Daniel 5 and this story of the fall of the Babylonian empire, I cannot help but think of where we are at as a nation and the slippery slope of both pride and blasphemy in our society and culture and country. Now, let me be very, very clear about our country. I believe that we live in the greatest country in the world. I am so thankful and I believe that we ought to be so thankful to live in such an amazing country and if you do not have that perspective, I would encourage you to take a mission trip with one of our teams in the next year. Just spend three, four, five days a week. Spend a few days on the mission field in another country, and I promise you it would make you very, very grateful for this privilege that God has blessed us to, to live here in this nation. We have an amazing country. At the same time, I think of the path that we have been on, and not just even in recent history, but if you go back to 160 years ago, take President Abraham Lincoln. Here was a man who had such a heart posture before the Lord that our president 160 years ago this year, he, the president, proclaimed a national day of prayer, fasting, and humiliation before God. I want you to listen to his words. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened, and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. And as I read that today, that in no way is a political statement. 
Because quite honestly, I don't know the hearts of any of our presidents. I don't know that I've seen this level of humility or heart posture before God in my lifetime in a president. Again, God knows the heart. But what I am saying is what an example of humility before God to acknowledge that the greatness of what God has blessed us with, it comes from him. And here we are 160 years later, and I think about how we in society, we take things that God has already determined in his word, that God has already spoken purpose to in his word, and we talk about them as if God has asked our opinion on the matter. Like we talk about, for example, the unborn in society as if it's up to us on when life begins. But God has already determined that. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God determined that. Like we talk about gender in our society as if we get to choose when God has said in his word that he has fearfully and wonderfully made us as we are. Listen to all of our young people here today. I want you to know something. God did not make a mistake when he made you. You are perfectly made as you are, and don't you forget that. God did not make a mistake when he made you. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. We talk about marriage as if we have the right to define it. But marriage was God's idea. And marriage is God's institution that he's clearly defined in his word as between one man and one woman. Genesis 2, 23 and 24, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And I just wanna be so clear as I speak to these things, in no way, shape, or form are these political statements. These are just simply truth from the word of God. And the danger is, is that we would think of these as political statements. No, these are just ways that God has spoken. These are areas he's spoken into already. And as we're talking about a warning, I believe that Daniel 5 is not just a warning to a nation. I believe that Daniel 5 is a warning to the church as well. What what do I mean by that? Well, maybe even we in the church, we have this mindset that we get to pick and choose the parts of God's word that we like or that are conducive to our lives, and then we discard the parts that we don't like. But God has spoken, and his word has settled all the matters of our lives and all the matters of our worldview. I want you to write this down. The writing is on the wall if we reject the authority of God's word. Because what this discussion ultimately boils down to is an issue of authority. And to be under authority, and I realize you hear that and some of you, it really rubs you. But let me just explain what to be under the authority of means. To be under the authority of something means to be under the rule of and the protection of. And a lot of us, we we don't understand the kingdom. Like, it's not a democracy. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. You don't vote for Jesus as king. Like, Jesus is king. And his word is law. And to be under the authority of his law means that I come under the rule of his word, under the rule of his law, and under the protection of it as well. And understand, 
that it's true not just for these issues that I've mentioned, it's true when it comes to your marriage, you want your marriage under the rule and under the protection of the word of God. You want your children under the rule and the protection of the word of God. You want your finances under the rule and the protection of the word of God. You want your career under the rule and the protection of the word of God. We're talking about the authority of God's word under the rule and the protection of. You want all of your relationships under the rule and the protection of the word of God. And I know, like, I hear it. Well, God's word, the, the Bible, it's so outdated and so irrelevant. And you hear this a lot. It's so restrictive. No, God's word and his ways are the key to freedom. Not restriction, freedom. Psalm 119, 32, I will run in the way of your commandments. Like run. When you enlarge my heart, there's another verse of the Bible says, you have set my heart free. You can run when your heart is free. And that's what the word of God provides for us. Like, so take an example. It's so restrictive. Well, well, let's just use another example. Take sex outside of marriage. The Bible's so restrictive when it comes to sex outside of marriage. Well, God has clearly defined what sex is for in his word, for marriage. He's clearly defined marriage in his word. And, and, and you get outside of that. You get outside of or out from under the authority of God's word. That's not freedom. That's bondage. And the danger is, is that you continue to reject the authority of God's word, and it just leads to deeper and deeper levels of bondage. You want all of your life under the authority of the word of God, under all of his rule and all of his reign. And let me just even tell you that even as a pastor, like every day, I encounter something in the word of God that rubs my heart. Every day, I'll read the word of God and God will point out areas of my life. Hey, that needs to be surrendered. This needs to be surrendered. Like God loves us just as we are, but he refuses to leave us that way because he wants us free. And freedom is in the word of God, the authority of God's word. So in response... To Belshazzar's pride and blasphemy and dishonor, th this hand now comes from the presence of God himself. Look at this, verse 24. Then from his presence, the hand was sent. From his presence. And the writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. The translation is just simply numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Verses 26 through 28. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You've been lacking morality. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And God who gave the nations to Babylon now is going to give Babylon to the nations, just as God said what happened in his word. Write this verse down, Jeremiah 27, verse seven. Jeremiah, contemporary of Daniel, he speaks to Nebuchadnezzar about Nebuchadnezzar, and he says this, all the nations shall serve him, Nebuchadnezzar, and his son, Nabonidus, and his grandson, Belshazzar, until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. So the final part of Daniel 5, verses 29 through 31, Daniel's rise in Babylon's fall. Verse 29, then Belshazzar gave the command. He responds immediately. And Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. The king responds immediately and so does God. Verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. Now, 
Daniel does not give us much detail in Daniel 5 about the actual fall of the city of Babylon. But there are, as I said earlier, a number of historical sources that supplement the biblical account that we have. Those two Greek historians that I mentioned earlier, Herodotus and Xenophon, they both record on the very night of the feast that the Medo-Persian army was waiting outside of the city and they waited for the feast to occur and when it was set into motion, they diverted the Euphrates River, which ran underneath of the city walls of, this, of Babylon. They diverted the river upstream from the city and the water ran into a nearby marsh. And of course, as they diverted it, the water levels began to lower. And when it reached a certain height, they waded underneath of the city walls. And this city that this king thought was impossible to overthrow, in his pride and in his arrogance, comes its fall. And with it comes the fall of the Babylonian Empire. Two cuneiform documents, which are called the Nab Nabonidus Chronicles and the Cyrus Cylinder, they also tell us that a Medo-Persian army entered Babylon without a battle under the general by the name of Gobrias. And a few days later, Cyrus, who was the king of the Medo-Persian empire, he entered the city and he was welcomed and received warmly by the city's inhabitants. Verse 31, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now, we're not gonna get into who this is this morning. We're gonna wait until next week in Daniel chapter six. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Darius the Mede. And of course, next week, the lesson that we all know from Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den, which you're not gonna wanna miss. But I will say this, that it is ultimately under King Cyrus that the Medo-Persian empire is going to overthrow the Babylonian empire. And if you know your biblical history, you know that it is King Cyrus who God will use to allow the exiles to return from Babylonian captivity to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the city and the temple. Now, I know, I know, I know how hard a message like this can be because here's why. This morning is the second time in two weeks that I preached on pride. So this morning is like a round two with pride. And any time that we open God's word and it gets to matters that are close to the heart, it can rub a lot. It can create a lot of friction in our hearts. And so I know, I know how sensitive this discussion can be today. But I just wanna encourage you because I love you and more importantly, because God loves you. I wanna encourage you that God has spoken today through his word. Even maybe things you don't like, don't agree with. I just wanna encourage you to keep your heart open to the word because ultimately it's in his word that we're gonna find our freedom. And so that means that if you've been operating in isolation, you've been living out there lonely or among the wrong group, I wanna encourage you today. Don't just hear the word, do something about it. Stop by connection point this morning as you leave. Get plugged into a small group. We have so many groups that you could join to be a part of. Maybe this morning there's been something that you've been saying to yourself, maybe as a couple, maybe as a family. I know we need to, but I would just ask you, is God working in that area? And in what way do you need to actually step through now in obedience? Let's not be people who know what to do and don't do anything with it, deceiving ourselves. Let's be hearers and doers of the word. And then, is there any area of your life right now that's out from under the authority, the protection and the rule and reign of King Jesus? And if it is, I just wanna encourage you. Let's lay this at the feet of Jesus today. Surrender to him. Let's stand to our feet. Father, thank you for this time you've given us in your word, for the truth, the power of your word. And God, I thank you for the promise of your word that your word will never return void. It will always prosper in the reason that you sent it. 
which means, God, that you're working in my heart today. And it means that you're working in all of our hearts. God, we want to decrease. We want you to increase in our lives. We want to be freed of ourselves, Lord. And we want to run in the freedom, God, that you have for us. And so, God, as you have spoken, as you've given us ears to hear, now, God, I pray that we would have the courage to obey. And I pray, God, especially for anyone who has never trusted you as Lord and Savior, that today might be the day of salvation. They've been ruling their own life. They've been controlling their own life. And today they're tired of that. Today they're ready to say, Jesus, I want to do it your way. I want to surrender to you as my Lord and my Savior. If that's you today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. As heads about and eyes are closed and everybody's very still and quiet. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm going to invite the rest of us to pray it out loud as well, to support those who are making this decision for the first time today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. I believe he died for me, that he rose again. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin. I give you control of my life. And I ask for the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.